And our passage for today is Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 25. I'd like to invite you to turn there with me in your Bible, on your phone, or you can follow along on the screen. And if you're able, would you stand with me to honor the reading of God's word? This is Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 1. It says, For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they have not ceased to be offered, since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sins. But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body have you prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings, you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. When he said above, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are offered according to the law. Then he added, behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. And by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And the, Holy Script- and the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us. For after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law on their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these... There is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, whether hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Well, good morning. Uh, My name is Dan. I'm one of the pastors and elders here at City Light. And um, as Pastor Andy said, we're glad that you're here um, this morning. I just want to note, if you're new with us and you're hearing uh, music, um, it's not just a a hum through the room here. There is another church worshiping downstairs. They do worship in another language. Um, We're glad that they're here, but that's the reason why we aren't worshiping with them, uh, because they're worshiping in another language. Um, Let's pray together, and then we'll jump into our sermon this morning. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunity to study it, understand it better, God. We thank you that your word is living and active, that it doesn't return void. And so this morning, God, I pray that you would accomplish the purposes through the preaching of your word that you've desired, that it wouldn't be what I desire to accomplish, uh, God, but it would be what you desire, that it would be for your glory. And I pray if there's any distractions this morning in our hearts and in our minds, you'd remove them so we could hear the word preached, God. And we do pray for the kids in the room and the parents, uh, but the kids especially, God. We pray that they would, from a young age, God, from the very beginning of their lives, hear the true gospel. 
God, that they would know the true gospel as it's taught by their church. And God, I pray that they would grow up to never have a day in which they didn't believe. God, we pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. Well, I think we can all relate to this example of light and momentary suffering. You head out the door to work. You're maybe running a few minutes late. You turn your car on. And the moment you do, the tire pressure light lights up brightly. This is always an inconvenience. And it always seems to happen when you need to go to work or school. It's never just when you're headed out for something that you don't necessarily have to be on time for. When Allison and I first got married, I drove an SUV that I really, really liked driving. But for some reason, it had all sorts of problems as it got older. And one of them was these tires could never seem to keep the air in them. Uh, it was, I don't know. It was probably there's a reason for it, but the tire pressure light always came on. I always had these episodes. I would get in the car. I would drive to Karen University for grad school or to Home Depot for work, and the light would pop on. I would have to stop somewhere to get air. Then a few weeks or days later, the same thing would happen. Same tire, I need more air. You know the drill. When this happens, it begins to happen more and more frequently to the point that I'm putting air in the same tire multiple times a week until finally, it's, I just can't take it anymore. I have to go get this tire fixed. But then that's inconvenient in and of itself because I've got to find the time to go either drop off the car or wait for it and then I've got to pay for the tire to be repaired or pay for a brand new tire. But, but here's the key. See, once the tire has been fixed, the problem is solved. I no longer need to leave the door with a baggie full of quarters to go to a gas station to fill it or a Wawa where air is usually free. The, the problem is taken care of. See, our passage today is going to teach us about another once and done taken care of situation. Christ's sacrifice. See, Jesus' death on the cross was a one-time sacrifice, meaning that Jesus accomplished all that needed to be done on the cross to secure our salvation at one time. To the contrary, the, old, the priests of the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, repeatedly, even daily, would make sacrifices that needed to be done to a uh, made sacrifices, I'm sorry, that would never be able to accomplish what Jesus ultimately accomplished on the cross. See, just as fighting the tire pressure light by making frequent stops for air at gas stations was never going to fix the problem of my damaged tire, the old covenant sacrifices were never going to accomplish what needed to be done to take away our sins. However, just as fixing that tire by going, getting it passed, or getting a brand new tire as going to solve my problem once and for all, so did Jesus' sacrifice once and for all solve the problem for my sins and for your sins. Now, obviously, I know, you know, that a properly working tire is not even comparable to the significance of what Jesus did on the cross. Yet I think we can all relate to that relief that something is taken care of. It's done. This is kind of what we're, this is what we're going to focus on this morning. This is what we're going to unpack. Jesus' sacrifice does the work necessary to forgive us of our sins. It is finished. And so our big idea this morning is Jesus' sacrifice is sufficient. And from this passage, we're just going to answer two questions. The first question is, why is Christ's sacrifice greater? The second question then is, how then should we live? How are we to live? Now, you may be sitting here thinking, wait, haven't we talked about this already? I feel like just last week, Pastor Andy mentioned something about a once and for all sacrifice. And even two weeks ago, we talked about Jesus' sacrifice. We, we unpacked it some. And, and, and if you're thinking that, good on you. <laughs> you're right. That did happen. But I think when we come across sections in Scripture that seem repetitive like this, they're probably repetitive for a reason. So it's good that we preach it again and again because we want to preach all of Scripture. But this morning, we're going to focus specifically on the greatness of Jesus' sacrifice. And so to do that, we're going to really focus the first, time, first part of our sermon on verses 1 through 18. And we're just going to really look at what they mean, and then from there, we'll apply them in our second point. All right, so let's answer our first question. Why is Jesus' sacrifice greater? 
Now, I like organization. So to answer this question, I'm going to kind of take us through three different sections of these first 18 verses. Um, they're not going to be on the screen. You don't have to write them down. But if you like kind of roadmap of where we're going, I'm going to share it with you. The, we're going to go through these three things. The inadequacy of the Old Covenant. Jesus' sacrifice replacing the Old Covenant. And finally, Jesus' sacrifice offers forgiveness of sins. So first, the inadequacy of the Old Covenant. The Bible is clear that mankind must answer for their sins. Our sin has separated us from God. The Bible is explicit in that regard. See, God is perfectly holy. And in the Old Covenant, to hold back God's wrath for their sins, the people offered sacrifices. Okay, that makes sense. But Hebrews 10 paints the reality of these Old Covenant sacrifices. They were continually done. See, the people would sin. They'd make a sacrifice to atone for their sin, but then they'd sin again. So then they'd have to make another sacrifice for their sin. So you can tell this isn't solving the problem of sin to the extent that was necessary. So let's read verse 1 again. For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities, it can never by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Did you catch how that verse started? It says the law is a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities. Dr. James Dolezal from Caring University says that the law shows you what a good heart looks like, but it can't make a bad heart good. The law shows you what a good heart looks like, but it can't make a bad heart good. Another biblical scholar helps us see the inadequacy of the Old Covenant by explaining that the law is not evil. The law is not evil. But it is frustrating and futile because it looks like a merry-go-round that never stops. Yet even with the frustration of the law, which God did institute, it points to something greater. Right? It can't make a bad heart good, but it tells you what a good heart should look like. It points to something greater. God's people knew that a sacrifice was needed to fully pay for their sins. But they also knew that they had no access to perfect righteousness. Which brings us to our second truth from this section of Scripture. Jesus' sacrifice replaces the Old Covenant. So I'm going to read for us verses 5 through 7 again. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have have you prepared for me. And burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. Now, let's pause for a moment here. The author here is quoting Psalm 40, and he's attributing the words to Jesus. He's saying Jesus spoke these words. And so how is that possible if Psalm 40 is in the Old Testament? And if you go to Psalm 40 in the Old Testament, you'll see that it's clear David is the author. That's all true, but but as people, all of us, we live on this side of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. We're able to read and understand Scripture, both historically and but also Christologically. See, Jesus is the true and greater King David. And so with that in mind, it's right that the author of Hebrews would attribute Jesus to be the one who spoke those words. But let's look at what this quotation actually points out. See, God did not desire sacrifices and offerings from Christ like God's people had been making in the Old Covenant. Instead, he desired for Christ to lay down his life his own body, but not just to lay down his own body, but to do it how? Willingly. Now, based on the way we just described these old covenant sacrifices, that they had to be repeatedly, daily, annually done, I don't think it's a stretch to assume that those uh, sacrifices became less from a willing heart and more from a ritual um, place, right? To say, I just got to do this. And that is not what God desired. But Jesus' sacrifice changes everything. Listen again to verses 9 and 10. 
Then he added, behold, I have come to do your will. So this is kind of explaining the quotation I just read. Behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. And by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Jesus' sacrifice canceled out the old covenant. Bulls and goats, the animals that the people sacrificed, did indeed die a death the people deserved. But they could not live the righteous life that God's people could not live. See, bulls and goats, they had no idea why they were dying. Not only did Jesus know why he was dying, which was to do the Father's will, but he's God. And thus, Jesus was perfectly holy. He lived a completely sinless life. And when he offered himself up willingly as a sacrifice for us on the cross, he became the final sacrifice. He is that perfect righteousness that the old covenant people knew that they needed but had no access to. And so the old covenant is no longer necessary because Jesus died in our place. A biblical scholar that I was reading this week, he said, why would you go back to animal sacrifices now that the Son of God has given his life for us? That's folly. Okay, so the old covenant is inadequate compared to the old covenant, compared to what Jesus did. But Christ's sacrifice also eliminates the need for the old covenant. So it's inadequate. Jesus says, well, let's not do it anymore because he died in our place. But finally, this passage teaches us that Jesus' sacrifice offers forgiveness, something the old covenant could not do. As our passage continues, the author explains that the old covenant priests would daily stand and make the same sacrifices repeatedly, and they could never take away Jesus' sins. But did you notice the contrast when Kristen was reading? The old covenant priests, they stood. They continually offered sacrifices. But it says that Jesus made a sacrifice one time and then he sat down. He doesn't stand, he sits. Until his enemies became his footstool. The work of the priest was never finished. It could never be finished. But Jesus' work is finished. See, just as when I kept putting air into that tire, I was never going to fix my problem. I was never going to find rest doing that. But once I finally paid for that new tire, the problem was solved. I could get up for work the next morning knowing that my low tire pressure light was not going to come on. The problem had been fixed. But the news gets even better for us. Because of the sufficiency of Jesus' sacrifice, you and I never need to sin and then repent and then worry that we're not forgiven. When I filled my tire with, my tire with, uh, with air, uh, whether with that baggie of coins that I carry around or at Wawa, I was like, well, I hope that's good enough. I hope that's going to solve the problem this time. But in the back of my mind, I knew it might not, probably won't. When you and I sin and repent, we don't have to worry like that. It's done. It's taken care of. If you've trusted Christ as your Savior, you're forgiven. There's no need to worry. There's no need to fear. Jesus' sacrifice is sufficient to forgive you of all your sins. And church, that's what I really want you to hear from this first point this morning. Your sins are forgiven. You've been cleansed by Jesus' sacrifice. You've been perfected by God for all time. Verse 14 confirms this. And here's the mark of the new covenant. This was in our passage. It says we've been given new hearts, we've been given new minds. Our sins are remembered no more by the Lord. The sacrifice of Jesus is sufficient. The old covenant sacrifice could not cleanse. It could not forgive sins. Instead, it actually served to remind the people of their sinfulness, but it's gone. It's, it's forgiven, or it's, it's not necessary anymore. Listen to verse 18 as we wrap up this first point. It simply says this, Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. The repeated old covenant sacrifices were inadequate to bring about salvation. 
couldn't forgive sins. But Jesus' one-time sacrifice was sufficient. His work is finished. So because this is true, because all of what we just talked about about Jesus' sacrifice, we now need to answer the second question from our passage. How are we to live? The author of Hebrews in these last couple of verses gives us three specific applications for how we should live, how we should endure, how we should persevere as disciples of Jesus together. I'm going to give you those in one second. So the three points of application, again, organization here. Draw near to God. Hold fast to our hope. And finally, stir up one another to love and good works. So first, draw near to God. Verses 19 through 22 say this. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Now, as New Covenant, New Testament people, it's easy for us to take for granted that we have the freedom to enter God's presence because none of us have ever lived before Jesus came and thus none of us did not have access to God's presence except when we were non-Christians, but, but not in the same way as the Old Covenant people. So it's easy for us just to take it for granted. I pray, God hears me. That's the way it is. But, but we need, let, it's important to really remember why that's possible. And fundamentally, it's possible because Jesus' body was broken and his blood was spilled out on the cross for you and for me. In the Old Covenant, in the holy place, the the tabernacle could only be entered by the high priest, and he did it once a year. And if anyone else entered, they would die. But because Jesus has entered, because Jesus has died in our place, we don't just get a special, it's not just a special place in this church building that we can go into now freely and access God's presence But instead, we now can just go right into God's presence anywhere in prayer and enjoy enjoy his presence. And so I, I want us to not forget this fact that, wow, yes, it's true that Jesus came and died in our place because of God's great love for us. Ephesians 2 says this. John 3.16 says this, right? For God so loved the world. But, but don't forget the fact that it was also as vitally important that Jesus died, that his blood was poured out, that his body was broken in order for us to enter God's presence. This passage is calling us to draw near to God, and that certainly includes individual practices like prayer and Bible reading, but but the applications in this passage are more communal by nature. You may have noticed that they all start with let us, and so that's what we're going to focus on this morning is how can we apply this passage as a church body? So specifically, we gather together on Sunday mornings, and we draw near to God, and we're reminded of the gospel through singing songs, through praying together, through hearing the word preached. And as we draw near, we're drawing near to a holy God who has fully cleansed us from our sins. We are certain of our forgiveness. We are certain of our salvation if we have trusted Christ as our Savior. And so I want to ask you this morning, are you drawing near to God with full assurance that you're forgiven? Or are you distancing yourself from God because of shame or guilt? Are you distancing yourself from God because you feel unworthy because of sin in your life? See, for Christians, assurance of salvation is an ongoing struggle. But this passage is the antidote to that. If you've trusted Christ as your Savior, you can be fully assured of your salvation. It's that simple. You are forgiven, you are cleansed because of Jesus' sufficient sacrifice on the cross for you and for me. 
Okay, the second way that we should now live considering Christ's sufficient sacrifice is to hold fast to our hope. Verse 23 says, Let us, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, wavering, for he who promised is faithful. We endure as followers of Christ by holding fast to the confession of our hope that we are sinners, saved only by the work of the cross of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, how can we do this? How can we hold fast? Well, the verse tells us the, the way we can do this is because God is faithful to his promises. In Paul's letter uh, to the Romans, we read that nothing in life can separate us from the love of Christ. There's a whole list of, of examples that Paul gives, and he says, none of these things can separate you from God's love, and, and thus it demonstrates, reinforces God's faithfulness. Church, your efforts, my efforts, cannot keep our salvation. Our future hope is assured, not because of anything you've done or will ever do, but because of Jesus' sufficient sacrifice on the cross. So hold fast without wavering. Be immovable like an anchor in the sea to the hope of God. So again, I'm going to ask you a question. Are you holding fast to your hope or are you finding hope in the world? At City Group on uh, Wednesday, City Groups are our small groups that meet throughout the week. One of the questions was in our discussion, how can we encourage one another in facing the reality of death? One response was to grieve with one another, but also to remind each other that we do not grieve without hope. I thought that was so helpful. In times of doubt or uncertainty, let us endure, let us hold fast to the hope that we have together by reminding one another of the hope we have. Okay, third way that we should live considering Christ's sufficient sacrifice is stir one another up to love and good works. So let me reread verses 24 through 25. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. The Christian life is not meant to be lived alone. That's why when we get up here and do the announcements every Sunday, and we, we define what a disciple is in different ways, and we, we want you to get connected to the life of our church, not because we, we need more people in small groups, whatever, but because we fundamentally believe that that's what a Christ follower does, is they're involved in a local church. And if we consider that logic, it makes sense. See, most of our day is spent away from the body of Christ, right? We, we go to work, um, we take our kids to school, whatever the case may be. And in, and in the world is where we are. The messages of the world, they come at us constantly. And the sin that the world presents, it's, it's appetizing, if we're honest. So how do we avoid then being pulled by those appetizing sins? Well, the text tells us. It says encouraging one another with the truth of the gospel and by being together. A couple of years ago, um, my wife Allison and I were watching a Penn State football game at a restaurant in Denver that had been rented out by the Penn State Alumni Association. It's completely filled with Penn State fans, capacity crowd, everybody's wearing white. And even though we were far from State College and far from Pennsylvania, we were being stirred up with fervor for our team and our university because of who we were with. Now, maybe me more so than Allison, but still, the illustration holds. In the same way, when we gather on Sunday mornings, we are encouraged to endure and persevere together. We are in, stirred up to what we surround ourselves with. So that is why online, live streaming church is not a viable alternative to gathering with the people of God. It's one of the reasons why years ago now, Pastor Andy and I made the decision we're not going to live stream anymore because we believe in the gathering of the people of God. How can you be stirred to love and good works and encourage each other when you're alone in your living room? 
clearly, based on these verses, our participation in the body is not just about receiving. It's not just about coming here and saying, oh, the music was good, the sermon was good, but it's about also participating by encouraging each other. And your presence encourages each other. Because when you sing the songs that we're going to sing, that we've sung and we're going to sing loudly, you're encouraging one another's hearts. We must gather together if we want to endure and persevere in the gospel. We need to be encouraged with one another, by one another in order to follow Jesus for a lifetime. Pastor Ben Lacey uh, is a pastor in Fort Worth, Texas, and he captures how we should view the church well when he says, most people see the church as an event on a calendar, but we see it as a people to center our lives around. Most people see the church as an event on a calendar, but we see it as a people to center our lives around. And there's an urgency to live like this. We're told to do this, encourage one another, gather, all the more as you see the day drawing near. No one knows exactly when, but Christ is going to return, and when he does, he's going to make his enemies his footstool. So why delay in encouraging one another? Why delay in being encouraged? Participating in the body of Christ is not something we can put off. It's not like getting your ceiling painted, which we're putting off at our house. Being a part of the covenant community is an urgent matter for the sake of our perseverance. Now, I've spoken a lot today to Christians uh, in the room, reminding us of Christ's sufficient sacrifices and how we ought to live as a result. But if you're not a follower of Christ this morning, I want to speak for you to you just for a moment. Jesus' sacrifice made a way for your sins to be forgiven. It's the only solution to the sin problem. You cannot earn God's favor in another way. And, and you may be feeling like you're on that merry-go-round, um, like that illustration I used earlier. You chase joy and fulfillment in your job, but then you get a bad review or you're laid off. You chase meaning in your marriage or parenting, but then you find yourself in a difficult patch in your marriage. Are you tired from striving each day to figure life out in the things of this world? I want to invite you instead this morning to rest in the finished work of Christ. His sacrifice is sufficient to forgive your sins and give you full assurance and a certain hope. All you need to do is believe and receive in that sufficient sacrifice. So church family, as we close this morning, the application from this passage is not for us individually, but us as a body. Let us. Let us be a place where we're constantly reminding each other that Jesus' sacrifice is sufficient. When we sin against each other, and we will, we can be gracious to call each other to repentance because Jesus forgives sin. When one of us begins to waver and put our hope in our comfort or um, our finances, let us call them back to Jesus. When one of us is having a difficult season in parenting, let's encourage them. Jesus' sacrifice is sufficient. It is our hope. And so let's not forget that we have a great high priest whose body was broken and blood was poured out for us. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that Jesus' sacrifice is sufficient, God. We are so inadequate, but we are so thankful that it's done. The work is finished, God. Our sins, they are many, but your mercy is more. And God, I just thank you that your, your mercy, your grace, Jesus' blood that was poured out on the cross is always going to be enough to make us white as snow. And Lord, I pray that that would sink into our hearts. And Lord, I pray that as we remember those things about the gospel, we remember specifically that our sins are forgiven, that we would then live differently in light of that, that we would, as a church, draw near to you with full assurance, that we would hold fast to our hope, and finally, that we would stir one another up to love and good works, so we'd continue to meet together, and God, I do pray that we would be a church body that doesn't see this gathering of your people as an event, but as a people to center our lives around. Lord God, we pray all these things in your Son's name. Amen.